I just want to provide a little bit of introduction here. How long have we been collaborating together now? It's been um, five years or I've been kind of losing track. It's been quite a while. Eh? That sounds about right, Ian. Yeah, five years. Yeah. Yeah. So Andrew reached out to me quite a while ago um, in regards to our keen interest in focusing on honeybee nutrition. I think we both have the same wave wavelength on that and just looking at what's going on within the environment and within agriculture and what the bees need and maybe there's deficit there and how as beekeepers we could fill in that deficit with something like a, like a, a supplement or some kind of a nutritional profile to help um, increase the overall health of the honeybee. So for the last little while, we've been just kind of dabbling here and there. I always joke that you're the brains and I'm the bees and we're just kind of <laughs> finding sure. our way we'll through. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also say that uh, oh. you're either absolutely brilliant or batshit crazy. So we're just on that borderline. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, we've been kind of... You're, you're the only... You're not the only person to have ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> we could kind of dabbling with some uh, different uh, recipes and supplements and all this kind of stuff. And, and over the last while, I think you've been very effective in putting together this uh, product to help focus on exactly what we've been trying to achieve here. Been using your product for the last uh, two years for sure. And I think I'm seeing an overall response and better health and just helping me get through tight situations. But uh, maybe I'll hand it over to you, Andrew. Uh, just describe the product you have, and I think you have a presentation there you'd like to step through. Very good. Uh, an investigation into the nutritional composition of floral pollen and floral nectar. By and large, uh, there was a landmark work uh, that was produced uh, by De Groot, and that work really has lasted for, for multiple decades now as the backbone of artificial feed formulations for honeybees. Uh, and he studied the proportional relationship or the minimum proportional relationship requirements of 10 essential amino acids. The question that I had was, do these historical observations accurately reflect the nutritional or amino acid composition of floral pollen? And then by extension, define the nutritional requirements of, of the honeybee. One of the first things that jumped out at me when I started to compile uh, that data was the amino acid uh, profile. So I have uh, De Groot's 10 uh, that he initially studied uh, over here under the yellow bar where I have mTOR activation thresholds uh, being referenced. I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I want to draw special attention to uh, is the other side of the amino acid profile of, of floral nectar and floral pollen that really nobody's been paying any attention to uh, because it wasn't a part of that landmark study of De Groot. It's really kind of gone on rec unrecognized. The bulk of the free amino acid content of floral pollen and floral nectar exist in this profile between alanine and tyrosine. So all of the primary study and all of the primary focus on this amino acid profile uh, over here uh, has left this blank spot in artificial feed formulations that actually represent the majority. Uh, and I couldn't say by orders of magnitude, uh, but certainly the greater majority of the amino acids in nectar and pollen are represented over here between alanine and tyrosine. One amino acid in particular, proline, if I was to represent this graphically on this chart, this chart would need to double in scale in order to represent the proportional relationship of protein, uh, proline to the rest, the rest of the amino acids. It's, it's dominant and, and, and meaningfully so. If you dig into the research, I, you know, I reference a few publications here and a few slides on, on proline, but it is very biologically significant to the honeybee for immunocompetence uh, and, a, and a whole host of, of key physiological pathways. Immunocompetence and how that translates into apiary performance. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go through this slide verbatim, obviously, but here are some of the uh, immunological challenges that, uh, that an apiary face today. Uh, it, it can be pretty overwhelming, especially in the context of... Um, Apiaries that exist in an agricultural uh, setting where they're dependent on artificial feed formulations a lot through the, through the year. Um, and there's a general lack of diversity uh, in what's available uh, from, the, from that environment. Uh, it, it can be problematic. So, so mono, monocrop 
uh, sources uh, of pollen kind of limit the, the diversity of nutrients that you're going to get. And when you're leveraging artificial feeds uh, to supplement uh, that, that nutritional deficiency uh, in the environment and those artificial feeds aren't formulated to address key, key amino acids or the most dominant amino acids in nectar and pollen that are directly responsible for immunocompetence of the honeybee, it, it's a problematic situation. I just wanted to highlight that there, you know, I, I took some time to speak about proline. It is the most dominant amino acid in nectars and pollens, uh, and it is primarily responsible for the entire hu humoral immune response of the honeybee. Just, just maybe a point of distinction there on the humoral immunity in a honeybee. It's in mammals like humans. We over the last few years we've heard a lot about the immune response and the production of you know antibodies uh, as as a part of our humoral immune response. Well, in honeybees. Uh, they don't produce antibodies. They, they produce AMPs or, or antimicrobial peptides. And those antimicrobial peptides are their, their function, uh, how well they perform uh, in being produced in adequate concentrations are ex completely dependent on adequate proline and adequate cysteine. Uh, and those amino acids, again, are not currently being addressed by artificial feed formulations. So we'll dig back into proline here. I think this is very important. Proline is the most dominant amino acid in floral nectar and floral pollen, worker and royal jelly, and the body tissue of the honeybee, with drones having the highest body concentration, followed by queens and worker bees, respectively. Second only to carbohydrate, proline is the most sought after and utilized nutrient by the honeybee. And proline is unique because honeybees have the ability to taste this unique amino acid. It not only contributes to a taste preferred by the honeybee, honeybees, but it stimulates their salt cell, which is a chemosensory receptor, resulting in increased feeding behavior or a phage stimulant. Like if you see people, there's a few videos kind of kicking around of folks uh, doing side-by-side -side comparisons of biocontrol being in some syrup uh, versus, you know, just straight sucrose syrup. The bees will always uh, preferentially uh, take, take feed that has uh, pro proline in it. Proline increases honeybee cold hardiness by, utilize, by being utilized as an antifreeze protein that lowers their supercooling point. The hemolin for the blood of the honeybee contains proline at approximately 50% concentration of the total amino acid composition. This amino acid plays a vital role in the honeybee immune defense mechanisms, both humoral, uh, the production of antimicrobial peptides, but as well as cell-mediated immunity. Proline is also oxidized as a metabolic fuel by the honeybee, acting as a secondary energy source, assisting with the in-hive metabolic demand uh, during uh, for, for thermal, thermal regulation and early stage flight. So that initial you know, burst of flight uh, when they first launch, uh, it's, there's some research that indicates that this is uh, the oxidation of proline, uh, and then it's uh, carbohydrate that sustains that, uh, that flight. I'd really encourage uh, beekeepers and, and anybody interested in, in nutrition to think about think about food and, and nutrients as epigenetic factors. They, if, if key nutrients are not present or they're not present in adequate concentrations, you don't get activation of key metabolic pathways. And mechanistic target of rapamycin uh, pathway uh, is one of them. This is an interesting compound. Um, gamma amino butyric acid or GABA. So this neurotransmitter present within both floral pollen and floral nectar is known to provide critical support to the honeybee in both reversal learning tasks as well as primary motor functions. In honeybees, GABA plays a role in the regulation of various physiological processes, including learning, memory, and social behavior. It has been shown to affect the response of honeybees to certain stimuli such as odors and taste and to modulate their sensitivity to sucrose, which is obviously an important source of energy uh, for the honeybee. Research has also suggested that GABA is involved in the regulation of honeybee aggression and the coordination of social behavior in the hive. Uh, for example, when honeybee colonies are threatened, obviously they get aggressive. Uh, GABA levels have been found to be found to increase in the honeybee brains in response to these threats, suggesting that it plays a role in the regulation of aggressive behavior. Furthermore, GABA has been shown to be involved in the regulation of sleep uh, in honeybees. Honeybees have been observed to sleep for short uh, bouts throughout the day, and GABA has been found to play a key role in the initiation and maintenance of sleep uh, for honeybees. In summary, gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, is a neurotransmitter that plays a role in the regulation of various physiological processes in the honeybee, including learning, memory, social behavior, aggression, and sleep. 
GABA is present within both floral nectar and floral pollen. And for the first time uh, through bioactivator and biocontrol, we are making this critical neurotransmitter available at biologically appropriate concentrations as a part of a nutritional support program. Proprietary bioactive profile. There's a, I'm not going to dig into this in a whole lot of detail because there's a lot of intellectual property here. I'm all, I, this is a, a challenging presentation for me to put together because it's necessary that I give a certain amount of intellectual property away. Uh, you know, I want beekeepers, anybody that's going to put, uh, you know, a few bucks down to give this stuff a try. I, I want them to know what's gone into it. Um, but at the same time, it's a double edged sword because, um, you know, you'll, you'll see, you know, supplemental feeds, you know, popping up with proline, that, you know, so there's that whole thing that I'm trying to balance here. Um, there's a lot of magic in this bioactive profile and a lot of uh, in-house R&D has gone into this. So I'm going to be fairly tight-lipped about most of this. So essentially what I have up here on screen is an example of multiple studies. Uh, you can do a quick, a quick Google search, uh, you know, go into one of the, uh, you know, PubMed or any, any of the repositories for, uh, for published published literature and you can validate this for yourself essentially what the phenomenon is is that over time uh, the trace element concentrations of our soil is being depleted uh, so there is some good baseline data of what pre-human agricultural activity trace element concentrations were in the soil uh, and in plants and i've kind of used that uh, humic shale uh, and, and seawater uh, baseline data to, to kind of get the uh, get get those ballpark uh, concentrations now the challenge with that is that we don't really understand the mineral requirements of honeybee very well that research hasn't bore, borne itself out yet uh, and here's here's where the methodology that i'm employing really gets its utility it really has its, its use case is that we can wait another 150 to 200 years uh, until the research funding goes to enough research scientists to take honeybees into a lab in isolation and one element at a time, you know, one concentration, one research publication at a time, start to tease that out uh, and, and the physiological mechanisms out one element at a time. It's going to take forever if we take that approach. Uh, this, this entire thought process or methodology was, okay, in a, in a resource-constrained environment where we need to produce results quickly, like we need more functional nutritional tools, let's just analyze the things that are in pollen and nectar. Assume that nature knows what it's doing. Uh, and that all of those things are there for a reason. And let's just mimic that uh, instead of, you know, waiting for these, you know, mess mechanistic research publications to, you know, happen over the next couple hundred years, one element at a time. This is where it gets complicated. I'm going to try to be coherent when I de deliver this message. But ultimately, when I'm talking about microbial metabolites, and I'm talking about bacillus subtilis. I want to make sure that I qualify what the message is. I, I, I don't, uh, in, you're familiar with this discussion about bacillus subtilis because I've been chirping in your ear for, for a number of years about this microbe. And it's been a big part of our in-house uh, R&D and, and test formulations. The, the challenge with this microbe for, for me is it's been, it was very easy to source this in the quantities that I needed to when I was doing, uh, you know, some in-house testing and, and working with, you know, guys, guys like yourself uh, to get some third-party validation. Uh, but to scale that up at a manufacturing level uh, with a grass a grass st status in, in the U.S. as well as Health Canada approval on that strain of microorganism, that's been the challenge. So it was a bit of a lag uh, in time when I first made these things commercially available to the update that's just recently happened. Um, so this this microbe is available in the updated formulation. I guess at the end of the day, uh, 50,000 foot view, the, the message is that the honeybee has a very intricate and interesting relationship with this microbe. And that relationship has really kind of borne itself out, you know, one research publication at a time over the last uh, decade or so. And I've been staying on top of this. It's been a, it's been a, a topic of interest of mine for, for quite some time. And I think there's enough information now that it's a co it paints that uh, coherent story and, and a message. So again, that message is about a microbe uh, and honeybee and a very intricate relationship. So Bacillus subtilis is a ubiquitous environmental microbe. 
it's all over everything, essentially. It's in the soil. It's in the intestinal tract of most, most mammals. You take humans that live in concrete jungles, you know, in the depths of the city, you might find some, you know, exceptions to that. But any, any humans that have uh, interactions with, the, you know, the natural world are going to have this microbe uh, in their intestinal tract. And honeybees are no exception to that. Uh, this microbe's all over pollen. Uh, it's all, all through nectar samples uh, in the natural environment. And honeybees, as they're conducting their, their natural foraging activities, are being exposed to this microbe. They're collecting it with nectar samples. They're collecting it with pollen samples. And they're bringing this microbe back to the hive. And through those food processing mechanisms that they have inside the hive, so nectar into honey and pollen into bee bread, there's a fermentive activity that takes place. And this microbe, as it's con consuming poly polysaccharides and disaccharides, in some cases, monosaccharides, inside those two uh, food mat matrices, it, it's producing metabolites that are nutritive to the honeybee. So there's a good you know, body of research on this microbe more as a, as a probiotic. It does produce some think compa it does produce enzymes, amylases. Um, so it, it helps the honeybee in some regard, help, helps them digest your food. It does produce some antimicrobial compounds called bacteriosins. There's a good body of research on that. But that's not why we use this microbe. One of the primary metabolites or end byproducts of fermentation by this microbe is a compound called menaquinones or MK7, um, more commonly known as vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 um, essentially acts as a very important redox molecule in uh, the honeybee mitochondrial electron transport chain. There's actually two, two pathways that it acts as a redox molecule in um, the mitochondrial electron transport chain bridges a gap between complex two and complex three, making that system more efficient or helping to stabilize it under high oxidative, high, high oxidative load situations. But it also, so there's, I guess there's two pathways in the honeybee that produce ATP or adenosine triphosphate. If for, for those not familiar, adenosine triphosphate is like the energy currency of a body. Uh, any multicellular organism uses uh, a mitochondrial electron transport chain to produce ATP. And the secondary pathway is called oxidative phosphorylation. Well, menaquinones, there's two, two molecules, uh, quinones and menaquinones that are absolutely of paramount importance uh, to stabilize these processes and make them efficient. Um, and it turns out the honeybee gets its uh, mitochondrial or energy production support molecules from bacterial fermentation uh, from Bacillus subtilis. So we, again, when you take, take the honeybee out of its in, environment and put it in a laboratory context, you start to miss some of these really key environmental interactions and, and cues that are taking place. Okay, so there's lots of evidence suggests, it's to suggest that it's there. Um, what is the role? What is it doing? So we talked a little bit about the mitochondrial electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation pathways. Here's some research publications specifically geared to arthropods uh, and honeybees around mitochondrial dysfunction, energy utilization, uh, that, that whole story. There's lots of, lots of research publications to support what I'm claiming here. But I find that to be a fascinating story that we're ending out. If anybody's interested in uh, the human microbiome, so there's been this, this whole project going on for you know a couple of decades now called the Human Microbiome Project, and there's just been a, a flurry of research funding and publications uh, on the human microbiota or this fermentive base that we carry in our distal intestinal tract. And what we're finding out more and more, like I'll give you an example. There's a recent discovery in the human microbiome that there's compounds compounds in uh, certain berries and compounds in certain berries like walnuts and berries like raspberries has this is called elagitanic acid and there are certain species of bacteria in our colon that uh, consume this elagitanic acid and as a as an end metabolic byproduct or metabolite or postbiotic it produces this thing called compound called urolithin a and that urolithin a uh stimulates or activates a, a pathway uh, called mitophagy. Uh, so our mitochondria uh, inside our cells, that our, our, our power plans inside of our cells, get stimulated or rejuvenated uh, through bacterial fermentation of a random you know, molecule called elagitanic acid by certain species of bacteria. Well, and what we're finding out is that, that that's not unique to humans in our fermentive base. Um, basically, what we're finding out is that 
multicellular organisms have this onboard chemical manufacturing or pharmaceutical manufacturing plant uh, in the distal intestinal tract. These, these resident and these transient microbes are consuming are consuming are consuming like polysaccharide fractions and certain components of the diet that the organism itself doesn't have the genes uh, doesn't encode doesn't have the genetic code to produce the enzymes to metabolize these components itself so because in nature there's no vacant niche certain microbes will come into that uh, distal intestinal tract um, that can metabolize those things and as a result, those metabolites, those end metabolic byproducts or postbiotics, you know, through evolution or design, uh, whatever your worldview is, uh, those metabolites, I, I just believe that there's no waste in nature. Everything that's there is there for a reason. As, and those metabolites have very key physiological roles to play within that organism. Uh, that stuff, the things aren't there by random uh, or by chance. Uh, they're there by, by design. So in a way, I guess, just trying to put it together in my head, there's all these nutrients that are available, but not necessarily available to the bee, but it's in a sense, it's the microbes that are helping convert it to an available source for the bee. Is that thinking about it the right way? Yeah, I think that's a way to frame it up. So the, the I guess the, the common vernacular around this concept right now is the idea of a prebiotic, things that feed microbes. Mm -hmm. And then there's the probiotic, the microbe itself. And then there's the metabolites of the microbe, which are being referred to commonly as postbiotics. So it's it's a new, it's not really the, the term that you'll see thrown around in research publications. It'll be referred to as metabolites or microbial metabolites. Um, but basically the things in the honeybee diet or the things in the human diet that we don't have the genetic code to produce the enzymes to degrade, There'll be microbes uh, from the environment that will come in and fill that niche that do have the genetic code or the capability to degrade those compounds. Hmm. And as they're degrading those compounds, they'll secrete new molecules or metabolites uh, that have key physiological functions within that organism. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so your product here, how does it classify? It is it would classify as all three. It'd be pre, uh, pro and postbiotic, right? Or am I we, thinking? Am I thinking about that right? So we've we've tried to we've tried to, so the next few slides uh, when we have a discussion about hemocellulose and why we've added that pollen polysaccharide, um, it certainly comes into the arena of pre prebiotic. I guess I basically I just want to qualify with 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 the audience here that I don't use microbes in this formulation for a probiotic effect like in the traditional sense. Okay. Um, I use this micro because it produces nutritional compounds as end metabolic byproducts that provide key redox molecules for the honeybee mitochondrial electron transport chain and then oxidative phosphorylation pathway. So your honeybee won't have a stable energy production system without the presence of this microbe and its end metabolic byproducts, menaquinones. Um, so it's not a probiotic effect that I'm chasing. I'm chasing that intricate nutritional relationship. Like what I'm, I guess what I would submit is that feeding honeybees a diet that's devoid of this micro and it's downstream metabolites, metaquinones would be suboptimal at best. There's a relationship between the honeybee and this microbe that needs to be respected. Uh, and my view is that it's Look, the research is sound on the probiotic effect, and these bacteriosins are, you know, quite powerful compounds, you know, helping out with that, you know, collective high of immunity, if you will. But that's not the reason that I pursue that microbe. It's an added benefit. It's there, and it'll produce that effect. But I'm chasing this. I've I used this microbe historically, and it's in the updated formulations because of vitamin K2 or menaquinones and the electron transport chain within the honeybee cells. Holy smokes. That's, uh, it's nutrition, I guess is, is the basis for this. Yeah, boy. Almost, um, in a sense, like the honeybees an omnivore with all the, like it's digesting the microbes to be able to, to access, especially this vitamin K here. Is, is that right? It's, it's, is it the decomposition of the microbes or is it the secretion of the microbes that's providing this nutrition? In some cases it's, the former, in some cases, it's the latter. So in the case of 
uh, vitamin K2 and Bacillus subtilis. So as Bacillus subtilis, it's a spore forming organism. Uh, so it has the ability, it's a very resilient organism. They're shelf stable. You don't have to refrigerate them. They can stay shelf stable for up to five years, but they go into this dormant state or spore state where they have this very tough outer shell on them. So that process of sporulation, so there's a, it's, a, it's about 35 minutes uh, that uh, I guess the reproductive cycle of Bacillus subtilis, if the environmental conditions are met. So as it's in this dormant state inside the spore, it has these little nodes that are sticking out and they're nutrient, they're environmental sensors, basically. And as soon as the moisture content, the temperature and the nutrient uh, profile is right in the environment, you know, based on those sens sensory inputs, it'll start to shed, shed that outer spore or the process is called sporulation. And then it goes into its vegetative state, which is a, a doubling rate of about 35, uh, 30, 35 minutes. As soon as it hits the temperature again, the right environmental conditions, as it's going through that life cycle, as as it's dying, um, it's giving off these vitamin K two uh, home loads uh, in into the environment because in prokaryotes or kind of bacteria, single single celled organisms, menaquinones is the driving molecule in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, but in prokaryotes, um, or sorry, in eukaryotes, multicellular organisms, it's, uh, it's actually a different molecule. It's, it's, it's quinone. Uh, so it's same kind of family of compounds, but a different compound. So basically why you're getting one of the reasons why you're getting vitamin K2, uh, in honey and bee bread samples, uh, is because of the life cycle and the death of Bacillus subtilis. It's giving up these molecules into the, in, into that matrix because, Basically, it's spewing out as, as the microbe is, uh, is dying. Hmm. It's not the only microbe that does that, uh, okay. but it does it very well. And it's got a, a very well-documented presence uh, within within the honeybee in kind of natural setting, right? Oh, yeah. We felt like it was a, a no-brainer to, to, you know, to leverage this information. What, what's not clearly understood, Ian, so, so we know that these menaquinones act as a redox molecule, and they act, act as a bridging molecule. So there's several enzyme complexes that make up this thing called the electron transport chain. Well, we know, e even though in honeybee cells, it's actually a, di a slightly different molecule called quinones that act as the primary electron transporter in that transport chain. We do know that menaquinones or vitamin K2 uh, can act as a bridging agent if there's a deficiency uh, between complex one, two, and three. It can actually form a, a bridge if there's a damage there uh, and reestablish efficiency. So it acts as a bridging molecule between complex two and complex, complex three. But the question that I would like to, you know, more answers to, and I think there's a really cool vein of research here uh, for people that have the, the, the capabilities and, and the funding is to what other things from a physiological perspective is vitamin K2 doing? Uh, in the honeybee, because it has multiple roles in, in mammals. I, it's a calcium transporter uh, in humans. Uh, you know, it's a very kind of well-kept secret that, you know, if you have arterial calcification uh, in a in human context, cardiovascular disease, you can dose about 300 micrograms a day of vitamin K2, and it'll reverse those arterial plaques. But that's well documented in the literature. So it, it takes calcium. It's a transport molecule. It keeps calcium out of your soft tissue and drives it into the bone structure where it needs to be. Is there a parallel mechanism inside arthropods? You know, is it uh, a part of a proper mineral utilization and disposition in the exoskeleton? There's all kinds of cool questions there to, to get answers to, but I don't know. And I'm certainly not, you know, making any claims there, but there's plenty of documentary evidence to uh, make the claims that I am here. This is all I can, I can back up why I'm using this microbe all day. Boy, talking to you is like drinking from a fire hose. I think earlier I said, you know, either brilliant or batshit crazy. And <laughs> right now I'm leaning to brilliant. <laughs> I'll Maybe. take it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. So another complicated story. I'm going to try to make this make sense to everybody. But on that same thread about the honeybee having this onboard chemical manu or pharmaceutical manufacturing plant in its distal intestinal tract. So one of those key species. and so we talked about Bacillus subtilis. Bacillus subtilis could be classified as not so much a member of the honeybee microbiome, but a transient member of the honeybee microbiome. It's present in all of the research uh, studies when people 
analyze the microbial contents of honeybee guts uh, because they're getting this environmental exposure to it, but it won't take up permanent residence in in anything. It doesn't do it in humans. It sticks around for a couple of weeks. So to get these effects, it's through continuous uh, environmental exposure uh, of the microbe. So a transient member of the honeybee microbiome, Bacillus subtilis. Bifidobacteria, on the other hand, is a part of the honeybee microbiota. This first research uh, publication, Division of Labor in the Honeybee Gut Microbiota for Plant Polysaccharide Digestion. So specifically, uh, these pollen polysaccharides, hemocellulose is a part of that class of pollen uh, intine layer polysaccharides, that the host, the honeybee, doesn't encode the genes necessary to degrade those polysaccharides, uh, but Bifidobacterium asteroides has come in to fill that niche. And when the honeybee consumes pollen, the, those hemocellulose and other polysaccharide molecules are getting consumed by this microbe, and their metabolites are directly stimulating host hormones that are known to impact uh, bee development because th there's been a lot of research interest and a lot of inquiry and just thought process in general around better understanding that annual cycle of the honeybee colony and what are the triggers or what are those mechanistic switches that get engaged in the spring um, when well juvenile hormone titers you know start 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 to go up um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on whether or not that's the the act of foraging itself. You know, it's the flight activity coming back to the hive that's stimulating those, uh, you know, hormonal uh, pathways or ep acting as epigenetic, you know, uh, factors. Um, there's been a lot of question as to whether or not it's around daylight hours, temperature. I wouldn't say that these research publications are pointing conclusively to the fact that it's microbially based. Um, but I think that they have a role to play. So we directly know, and these are recent publications. Now we directly know that the resident microbiome of the honeybee, when it's exposed to uh, plant uh, pollen polysaccharides from the intine layer of the pollen shell, hemocellulose uh, in particular, degrades those polysaccharide compounds, produces metabolites that impact physiological pathways responsible for prostaglandins uh, and juvenile hormone uh, derivatives. So there's a, there's a microbial factor here, which is environmentally driven. So I think it's another part of that story. Okay, just a minute. I'm going to take a shot of uh, bourbon, and then I need you to explain that last bit again, because uh, that sounded very interesting. Um, in high-level look, um, so there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of inquiry over the years about just try basically we're trying to better understand what is it that flips that spring switch inside yeah. a honeybee colony what is it that generates that nest turnover that initiation right so there's been writings on that being light driven temperature driven uh, the act of foraging itself like the, the flight activity the foraging itself being that epigenetic you know factor which all they all might be a part a part of an overall picture, but what these new publications around the gut microbiota are starting to uncover is that there's mechanistic relationships between bacterial metabolites, specifically Bifidobacterium asteroides, and its consumption of fractions of the pollen uh, protective layer, those polysaccharides, producing metabolites that are directly impacting hormonal titers uh, within the honeybee, so that springtime switch that gets flipped in the honeybee colony, we're starting to tease out uh, me mechanistic relationships between the gut microbiota of the honeybee and its metabolites from pollen polysaccharides. And it's, it's just not just uh, impacts on hormonal titers inside the honeybee. There's a bunch of stuff here. There's a, a bunch of other reasons why I'm using pollen polysaccharides. Um, same, same kind of concept, producing uh, producing beneficial uh, end metabolic byproducts, but but again, I I don't want to give all of my IP away here. We'll just kind of move. It. If ever, anybody's wondering what that bioactivator name is for, that that's kind of the basic concept. Is we talk about you know the me mechanistic target of rapamycin, we talk about the mitochondrial electron transport chain, and all of these nutritional cues that come in from floral pollen act as. Uh, activators they act as gene switches but they have to hit the right concept they have to be there first so we're, we're adding things that nobody else is but we're also coming over top of 
deficient states in key nutrients, and we're, we're bringing those up to activation uh, threshold levels. That's kind of the, the general uh, concept behind that name. Hmm. But what it represents, or I feel it represents, is the first truly full-spectrum amino acid profile uh, for artificial feeds. It's the first to provide critical, neuro, the critical neurotransmitter gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA. It's the first to provide trace mineral replacement or supplementation for APRAs existing within an agricultural context. So, if, you know, if you're a hobbyist or a sideline beekeeper and you live uh, in an environment where there's lots of natural wild forage and it's not in an agricultural area, you know, that uh, the significance of that trace mineral replacement would be diminished in that, that, that context, right? But that's not most beekeeping. Most beekeeping is, you know, in heavily agricultural, you know, environments, right? The first to bring you the leading edge science of microbially produced uh, menaquinones, Bacillus attilus and NK7, and by extension, nutritional support for the honeybee mitochondria uh, and oxidative phosphorylation pathways following nature's intricate design. I think that is such a cool story there about the relationship of the honeybee and, and that microbe. And then finally, uh, the first to bring you the leading edge science of bifidobacterium produced metabolites or postbiotics through dietary application of our proprietary whole plant, a bioactive profile. And we're, we're just getting warmed up on, on that, uh, that front as well. 